My name is Tam Nguyen. I'm a vascular surgeon at the uh, University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. I do a little bit of different kind of vascular surgery than the regular um, vascular surgery that you may see. Um, just for my own curiosity, can you tell, show a uh, hand, those of you that are in a fellowship program versus vascular residency? Fellowship program? And then integrated vascular residency? So maybe half and half, huh? Okay. Great. Um, so I'm asked to uh, present to you the management of visceral artery aneurysm, which is even more rare than the occlusive disease that we just had um, just heard about. And um, so although this is rare, you know, typically in exams, you tend to get these esoteric questions a lot of the time. So um, something that you need to know a little bit about. The um, aneurysm disease of visceral artery is rare, and the incidence is estimated to be something between 0.01% to 0.2%. Um, most of these are found asymptomatic on incidental finding, on CT imaging or MR imaging. The um, pathogenesis and natural history of visceral artery aneurysm disease is not really well known in part because it is so rare. Um, and it's estimated about 20% of these will rupture and mortality is um, obviously high with uh, rupture. So what we're gonna talk about is really it's just an overview of the management of visceral artery aneurysm in general, um, surveillance is indicated for small aneurysms, and then endovascular treatment is indicated as a first line of treatment for those that have suitable anatomy. And if the anatomy is not suitable, then surgical treatment remains the uh, gold standard. So visceral artery aneurysm, the distribution of the lo location is shown in this slide, and you can see that 60% of all VAA sort of is located in the splenic artery um, and about 20% in the hepatic artery. And then these other ones, the, the third and the fourth, are really SMA or celiac, about 4 to 5 percent of the time. So when you think about visceral artery aneurysm, you've got to think about, is it a true aneurysm or is it a false aneurysm? And although it's not always possible to determine what is the underlying cause, if it is a true aneurysm, then these are typically relate to acquired medial degeneration, although you can have secondary atherosclerosis. Um, the other less common causes of true aneurysms um, are people with connective tissue disorder, like Ehlers-Danlos type 4, and then people with chronic dissection of the um, SMA or celiac can also um, develop later on aneurysm of those uh, two vessels. And then the uh, pseudoaneurysms of the visceral arteries um, are really typically related to traumatic, and it could be blunt or penetrating. Um, it typically also can arise in a setting of pancreatitis, um, infection, and, and it could also occur in a setting of post-operative uh, procedures, just, such as after a, a Whipple um, operation. Now, the most common type of VA is really the splenic artery aneurysm. 60% of all VA are splenic in nature. And again, the prevalence is relatively low, less than 0.1% of the general population. These patients may have other VAA in about 3% of the time, and I think you've heard about renal artery aneurysm um, yesterday, and about 14% of all people with splenic artery aneurysm may have concomitant renal artery aneurysm. This is the only aneurysm that is uh, more common in women than men, and it is thought to be related to medial fibro dysplasia. Um, women who, other risk factors for the development of splenic artery aneurysm include women who have had multiple uh, pregnancies, Portal hypertension is the other risk factors as well. And in general, I think less than 5% will present with rupture. Now, what are the indications for treating splenic artery aneurysm? I think number one is symptomatic patients. And then the um, splenic artery aneurysm in women of childbearing age is one indication for fixing the aneurysm when it's relatively small. Um, some people would say any type, any size of splenic artery aneurysm in women of childbearing age should be treated. Um, the other patient population that are at higher risk of rupture is uh, patients after liver transplant is also at higher risk of rupture from splenic artery aneurysm, even though the aneurysm may be relatively small. But in general, if it's an asymptomatic splenic artery aneurysm, we don't usually treat those until it gets above three centimeter um, or more, uh, or if it's shown to have a significant growth rate. Now, how do you treat splenic artery aneurysm? Well, typically, you try and preserve the spleen in uh, patients. 
Um, endovascular treatment is, is probably the first line of treatment if the patient has suitable anatomy, and that can be treated with coil embolization or stent graft, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Open surgery is also um, the uh, sort of a standard treatment if, if uh, endovascular treatment is not possible. In open surgery, there's multiple ways of treating the splenic aneurysm. You can ligate and then do a bypass. You can do end-to-end -end anastomosis, or, um, or you can um, do an interposition bypass as well. Um, and any of those techniques can also be um, done laparoscopically, although I personally don't really have any experience in doing so. Now, Splenic artery aneurysm, when it involves the uh, segment of the artery closer to the hilum, um, they tend to be smaller, so stent graft of those lesions may not be possible. Um, so we tend to coil those that are um, sort of more distal, and also if the patients have a good anatomy, such as um, a narrow neck, or uh, if the, uh, the aneurysm is uh, saccular or, or a pseudoaneurysm. This is an example of a... Um, patient who had a stented splenic artery aneurysm fired prior to this uh, CT scan. And you can sort of see this is the, um, I can't really show it that well, huh? You can see the um, stent down here in the distal. And you can imagine how difficult it would be to navigate a um, cover stent to exclude that aneurysm. And that was indeed one of the difficulty in this case. But uh, it, um, this is a FOB CT five years after we excluded the aneurysm. This is another case of a splenic artery aneurysm, which is rather saccular, and you can see how uh, large the uh, pseudoaneurysm, uh, what, you know, it's hard to tell really whether this is a pseudoaneurysm or a true aneurysm, but it turns out to be a true aneurysm because um, we actually operate on this patient. But you can see here is another coronal view of that. And this patient had a rather wide neck, so we couldn't really coil it. Um, Although it was saccular, we actually attempted to put a stent graft, and you could see how torturous the artery is, um, and we actually were not able to put a stent in. And that patient happened to have uh, pancreatic cancer, and with this large aneurysm, we actually did combined surgery where we uh, did a Whipple procedure and actually um, excised or ligated the, the aneurysm and reconstructed it. And you, you see here is a post-reconstruction angiography showing the end-to-end -end anastomosis of the uh, preserved splenic artery. So common hepatic artery aneurysms are the second most common type of VAA. It, it occurs more so in men than women. It tends to um, occur in older patients, and about one-third of these also have other associated VAA, and about one-fifth of these may have associated splenic artery aneurysm. Eighty percent of all hepatic artery aneurysm are extrahepatic. And um, these can present incidentally, like splenic artery aneurysm. Um, and you may need to remember their Quinky's triad, which is a triad of abdominal back, back pain, jaundice, or hemobilia, and that may be uh, a sign of uh, hepatic artery aneurysm. And so what are the indications to treat hepatic artery aneurysm? Um, aneurysm greater than two to three centimeter in good risk surgical candidates. Um, if it is a pseudoaneurysm, typically they need to be treated because these tend to be um, at high risk of rupture. Or if the patient presents with hepatic artery portal vein fistula, that's another indication for treating hepatic artery aneurysm. So how do you treat hepatic artery aneurysm? Um, it depends on the location of it. Intrahepatic artery aneurysm uh, typically are treated by endovascular means, um, either coiling or, or glue. Extrahepatic hepatic artery aneurysm can be treated with endovascular means if uh, suitable anatomy is seen or open um, reconstruction. The um, good thing about coiling uh, or embolization of these uh, hepatic arteries is that they tend to have uh, very good collaterals from, um, from uh, the uh, other system and also because the portal vein is a major blood supply to the liver. This is an example of a common hepatic artery aneurysm. Um, this patient actually had pancreatitis about five years prior to the CT, and you would think that maybe this is a pseudoaneurysm, but it turns out to actually be a true aneurysm when we went in. The patient didn't have um, anatomy suitable for hepatic artery um, stenting, 
So we actually uh, did a uh, interposition bypass, excluded the aneurysm, and you can see this is the, uh, the aneurysm before we uh, excluded it, and this is the aneurysm after we did open repair with the saphenous vein graft coming off the um, celiac artery and um, the dysanasmosis to the common hepatic artery. So that was actually a true aneurysm, although you would have thought it may be a pseudoaneurysm because the patient had a history of pancreatitis. So it's not always possible to determine the cause in these patients. This is an example of a common hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm. This patient had a Whipple procedure and then developed uh, bleeding. And you can see this is a pseudoaneurysm of the common hepatic artery. Here's the selective angiogram uh, where we came retrograde and you can see the pseudoaneurysm coming off the common hepatic artery between the um, middle hepatic and the right hepatic. This is the um, pre-coil picture, and this is the post-coil. You can see that pseudoaneurysm is now excluded um, after we place in some coils. How about superior mesenteric artery aneurysm? This is the third most common location for visceral artery aneurysm. The indication to treat, again, obviously, if it's rupture. Um, asymptomatic patients, if the size is greater than two to three centimeters, I think in the literature you'll find that most people say that they would treat if it's greater than two centimeters. In real life, I have found in my own personal experiences, typically um, these tend to grow very slowly, and the rate of rupture is not as high as the literature would, would let us to believe. So um, most of these, again, are asymptomatic, and the treatment um, could be endovascular or open, depending on the anatomy. I want to show you a, um, an example of an SMA dissection. You can see this is a young woman who had a sarcoma resection, and you can see the SMA is as big as her aorta. Um, and we've watched this patient for a couple of years now, and she really has had no significant growth of the uh, SMA um, dilatation, or that size is about 1.4, and we have opted to continue to keep an eye on things. This is an example of an SMA pseudoaneurysm. You can see the patient had previous surgery, air in the portal um, system, and this patient had a Whipple procedure a few days, uh, a, f a couple of weeks actually before this, and you can see the pseudoaneurysm coming up. right there. So this is about, I think, 10 to 14 days post-Whipple procedure, and the patient would obviously a pseudoaneurysm of the SMA. And so we uh, took her and um, selected the SMA, and you can see the pseudoaneurysm here of the uh, main SMA, mid to distal part of the main SMA, See the pseudoaneurysm there. And this is um, our intervention. So we actually came from above in order to put that stent in, and you can see that we have excluded the uh, pseudoaneurysm with a cover stent. Um, finally, celiac artery aneurysm, it's um, about 4% of all VVA. Um, these will tend to have associated other site VAA. Um, treatment, again, is uh, obs observation. If the aneurysm is small, the patients are asymptomatic. And you can treat these, again, with endovascular means if it um, has suitable anatomy. But typically, the celiac artery is a very short artery, so typically it's very difficult to actually um, put any stent grafts into it or, or even coiling. This is an example of a celiac artery aneurysm. The other sites of uh, aneurysm formation in the um, visceral arteries include the gastroduodenal, pancreatic duodenal, and inferior mesenteric arteries. These are very rare, and if you find them, um, it's thought that they need to be ligated or excluded um, because they have a slightly higher risk of rupture. Finally, I want to close with just um, showing you the um, real-life um, data from, a, from the Mount Sinai, they uh, accumulate 59 cases of VAA, and um, this is over a 15-year uh, period. You can see that um, the age, the mean age is in relatively young patients, 56 
for the endovascular uh, group and open group uh, was 52. Females were a little bit less than male. And then um, what's interesting is more patients with endovascular treatment um, had uh, associated cancer. This sort of show that for the um, most patients had splenic artery aneurysm um, and um, the uh, patient with pseudoaneurysm were treated more in the endovascular group compared to open. And this is um, the presentation of these patients. Most are asymptomatic with incidental finding. So the complications and reinterventions is not um, unusual for when we uh, treat these visceral artery aneurysm, either endovascularly or open. And so that's sort of part of the reason why we don't treat these unless it's really um, symptomatic or larger size. So in summary, my take home message is visceral artery aneurysms are rare. We uh, recommend expecting surveillance for small visceral artery aneurysm less than three centimeters. Open endovascular treatments are satisfactory and acceptable for symptomatic patients with aneurysm greater than two or three centimeters. And uh, we um, recommend treating all student aneurysms because these are the ones that tend to rupture much more than the true aneurysms. Thank you very much.